I just want to minister out of Deuteronomy. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 12. Um, um, we had worship tonight, and so we were um, thinking about worship. Um, you know, uh, this, this sermon wasn't birthed from the song, but because I heard the song, the sermon was kind of kind of thought from the song. Brother Keith was singing, he wants to be trialed by fire. And, uh, you know, so I, I, um, I, I think I was just looking somewhere and I just heard him sing, I want to be trialed by fire. I want to be trialed by fire. And I was like, why do you want that? <laughs> and, then, and then we start to, then um, and other, other Keith came and we start thinking about all the, the, the nonsense songs people sing. And it's like, I mean, I just, you know, I mean, they sound really good, you know, the people who are singing it, but then you start to listen to the words and you're thinking, who ever would have thought about that? You know, burn me, burn me, God, burn it's like, why? why? Why would you want God to do that to you? You know, I'd be more singing, set me free, set me free, set me free. And you start to think about that. And so we call it man-made worship. Um, there is a there is there has been this Paul you know different uh, denominations or groups uh, singing groups on the media uh, who write songs and that's what they do they write songs but not just the songs that are written it's more the thought behind the songs and the the what they do to make the songs work and so. You know, it's all, as you know, you see them and it's all, the songs are kind of whatever it is and the guys are, and the people are singing it and it's, and it's kind of like moving and they've got the lights and they've got the background and the colors and, and it's just a really, it's, and it, they, so they create an atmosphere and not that creating an atmosphere to, to God to move this wrong, that's not what I'm saying, but you do get a sense of man-made worship. I was uh, I, I was one of the groups uh, worship team groups not from here from another place we, we flew them in and they were you know several years ago and then I you know I had the, the opportunity to bring them to uh, I think I went to uh, Tottenham and we, they done some music in Tottenham and then when they done the music in Tottenham it was I mean, it was fantastic. They done a worship song at the end, uh, and the guys, he's he's you know he's singing and he's, he does this whole thing, and so I'm looking at this guy and I'm like, man, this is just really really, you know, God's moving. And then I, I took him to another place, uh, and then he, he done he, t exactly what he did at the other place, and I, and I took him to another place, and I went and he did the same thing. And I went, hang on. <laughs> This is, you've orchestrated this. This is where I thought it was God and, you know, I'm looking at him and by the first time I was like, and then you're going to do that and then you're going to do that and then you're going to do that. So I'm going to just talk about man-made worship out of Deuteronomy 12. And he says these words, verses 1. He says, uh, uh, these are the Lord's statutes and the judgments which shall be careful to observe in the land which the Lord... God your Father has given to you as possession. And all these days you live on earth, you shall utterly destroy the place of the nations which you shall uh, depossess and serve the, and not serve their gods on the high mountains and in, on, on the hills and under every tree you shall destroy the altars and break their sacred pillars and burn, uh, burn them. Another uh, uh, verse in that would say, uh, uh, Free would say, uh, uh, the living Bible will say, the wooden images cut them down, the graven images destroy their names, and you shall not, you shall not worship <coughs> your Lord thy God in such a way. You shall seek a place for your Lord and choose uh, of the tribes and put his name, and he shall dwell in this place, and you shall go there, and you shall take a burnt offerings and sacrifices, the tithes and the offerings in the hands, and vow and offerings, free will offerings, and the firstborn of the herd and the flocks, and you shall not eat 
before the Lord thy God, but rejoice in which the Lord God has. Amen. Father, I pray your hand and help and your spirit, God, upon these words. God bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. So when we see worship, worship, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's quite a thing when you do see worship because the, firstly, we have the worship music. And the worship music are, are you know, lyrics which are good, which people are um, still um, talking about the old hymns, the hymns that, um, you know, blessed assurance uh, or uh, at the cross, uh, the blood. And so it seems like the blessed assurance, the cross and the blood has been done away with. And the new types of worship music has been now introduced to, um, to us by different groups. And, but they are centered or, or, or emotionally centered um, to touch your emotions and your feelings. And so you get the other type of thought that um, when people are in those places, um, and I've been to some of these where, where you know, one moment the, the everybody's hands and the person's next to you, they're worshiping and you, you, you lift up your hands and then you look over and see if they're worshiping and they're rolling on the floor. You're like, yo, what are you doing down there? And then you start to see the rolling and the, and the, the emotional thing starts to kick in. Um, churches nowadays, that do, uh, the, the, they are lighting companies um, that would you go to and they, their sole job is to um, set the lighting that there is, um, they set a mood for worship. And so the lights are out uh, as really low as you can. Uh, and it just sets your, this ambience in this place. Uh, and so what you'll find before man can even worship, man has come and he set moods and lightings and aromas for people to worship. So we call it now man-made worship. Where worship was always uh, the man who stood in front who had a love for God and there's something inside of him. You know, when we do worship, you know, we always, you know, it's always kind of thing when we start to think about worship. You know, man will always worship because it says, firstly, uh, we must understand man was created to worship and nothing else. The BBC News uh, um, speaks about the, the love and how men... Uh, uh, will cause themselves, uh, you know, they, they, it was a clip and it was a man, a man or people that spend £5,000 on tickets. Uh, they'll go to a place, uh, they'll travel and they'll go to a place, £5,000 a ticket to watch uh, a game. I was listening to the Super Bowl that was, uh, the, the, I think, the, 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 the team with the yellow uh, uh, football, American football, um, they were in, uh, the LA, down in LA, and they were doing the well, Super Bowl that's gone just last week, and uh, the, the, the arena couldn't fit as many people in, and they were selling some tickets for £25,000. Uh, some of the front rows was £100,000, and the guy says, will people pay? He goes, absolutely. And so, the, not just so much... They, the atmosphere, the singing, the chanting. Uh, so the BBC caught this of, of one of the football, our football matches, and it says the songs. And so, the, you know, the hands are up and they're, they're, it's almost like there's a worship for the team. Um, if you listen to, I mean, one of the, 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 the teams here in England, uh, which they say, which when they worship, I would say, or when they sing, they say uh, um, the, the, the vocal, the men's, uh, that's a team called Liverpool. Uh, uh, listen, listen to us. Okay, people screaming there. I, I, I'm, I like them, but I'm dissing them at the moment. Do you get it? <laughs> and, and they sing a song called You Never Walk Alone. And they say when you pan in the, there's a, a, there's a, there's a, part in the football stadium called the cop and as you go and you look at the cop they said you know you know just them singing and you know i would say you know yes they're singing but man was meant to worship 
They said Stephen Gerrard is a god. John Lennon said these words. He says, I'm bigger than Christ. Paul Daniels, who was a musician, says, I can do things better than Jesus. Julius Caesar says, I'm a god. But the empire he spoke about, people worship. So man felt to himself that we are gods. And so this is why they worship. You know, oftentimes when, you know, when people, we, 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 we're doing music or song service, you know, you know, someone says, hey, that brother can sing. Or, Do you know this guy can sing and this guy can sing? Why don't you, you know, pass one. And it's like, you know, but for us, it's not about the singer. You know, it's like, oh, pass one to get some great. It's, it's not about who can sing. It's who can worship God. That's what it's more about. It's about seeing men worship God. You walk through the door, whether you like the tone or you don't, you see a man, you think, wow, that man is worshiping God. He is not performing, he's not trying to set the mood and do the swing and everybody's, he's not trying to do that. He's trying to worship God and that you will see that somebody has worshipped God and see God in a new dimension and he's doing that and there's something about that which is absolutely powerful that a man would raise his hands to worship God. In Exodus 32, and it says, and when, the, and when the people saw Moses delaying, coming down from the mountains, the people gathered themselves and, and Aaron and said to, the, to him, make us a God which we can go before us as Moses, this fella, is not, who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, Egypt won't come down. So he fashioned them out of, uh, out of, grave, uh, uh, out of tools and fashioned them and molded a calf and he says to them, O Israel, who brought out Israel, this is your God. When Aaron saw they, that he had built an altar before God, and he proclaimed and says, tomorrow we shall fast before the Lord. Here's a progression. Man in the wilderness and man says, um, you know what, where's Moses? I thought he was talking to God. You know, we want God. Make us a God. So he takes the gold, the silk, the gold from the people, and he melts the gold, and he he makes a calf, a, a, a golden calf, and he says, "All right, today we are going to worship God." People make their own gods and call them gods. In Ezekiel, you know, uh, and Isaiah, one of the wonderful scriptures is when he he looks at the gods and he says. You will go out and you will chop down trees. And when you chop down the trees, you will start to carve out of the trees. And you'll make a God out of the trees. And you'll polish it and you'll sit that God down. And he says, but with the carving, the rest of the carving of the trees, you will put it under a pot and you'll light it and that will cook you food. And then you'll take the other remnants and then you'll keep yourself warm. And he says, listen how the mind works. He says, you actually made the God yourself. You fashioned him how you wanted him to be. And if the wood was holy, why therefore burn the wood? See, people made themselves things and called it God. And here's God. He speaks about their, their burnt offering, bringing these burnt offerings and these offerings to him. The problem we find... One, two. The problem we find today is that worship has become more charismatic and driven. And, you know, uh, people, you know, we often, you know, every time I talk about worship, people say, yeah, but David danced before the Lord. He also killed too. He did many things. He took another man's wife too. But he danced and he took somebody's wife. Right? Right? right. So, so, okay. So why don't we just do everything David done? And so the thought is that David danced before the Lord. 
<coughs> if you read the scripture very carefully and you, you analyze what happened, Michael, his wife, was disappointed with him. And she says, her words were, oh, you are showing yourself up to the women. And so they said, you know, so there's more to that scripture that meets the eye. It wasn't because David danced before the Lord that was highlight. It was that David danced before the Lord and he had, he had a short type of frock on. That's what it was. He's, the, the, the gown was short and he had nothing underneath. And so he's dancing and the women are like, so his wife says, hey, he does. you're showing yourself off to the women. And he gets angry with her and says, you shall not have a child. I will not sleep with you. So why don't we all dance before the Lord then? Right? So charismatic worship has gone so twisted, we start to think, well, you know what? This is what we do. We dance before the Lord. And so we roll before the Lord. We do all things before the Lord. So these are the studies. They say, well, this is, this is what it is. And so we find that <coughs> we call charismatic, um, charismatic worship, where we can, we can create an atmosphere and we can do things within this atmosphere because it's okay. And so we make ourselves idols. We put up idols. We think this is the way it should be. Deuteronomy, it was <clears throat> the mode of worship was man's desire. It, he fixed and he made a holy place on the hill <clears throat> and, and in the groves, uh, um, illumining the groves or, or, or a place on top and underneath. According to Barnes' notes, he said <clears throat> when man was worshipping, he put the, 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 the statues on the hill and down in the valleys. And so <clears throat> he made places where he can worship. He put them up in the hills and he put their idols there up in the hills <clears throat> and, and down in the valleys under trees and he left them. And God says, and, and so the, the, the thing is, up on top, was the, the, the idols. Down in the valleys was another set of idols. But what the idols were, they were um, not just normal idols, they were sexual idols. That's what they were. So, they were making images <coughs> of, um, you can imagine what they're making images of, and so it was like in the high places they brought their gods and they made prayers and still down the bottom. So <clears throat> it's like worship, you know, worship openly and worship in the groves where it's dark and you can't see. And so he's saying this is what they're doing up there. It looked all good to people. But underneath in the groves, in the hidden places, he says it was a bad scene. It's almost like the man who's in the church and he's worshipping. And then he goes to the sister, hey, let me come to your house tonight and worship. <laughs> God damn me. And so, guy, so it's like, it's like, it's like, what are you worshiping that time of night? Yeah. So, so it was, it was like God just looking at these people and said, "Man, you don't understand worship, because you think that openly you can worship in the hills and the mountains, in a high place to touch God, but you can have this." Another alternative type of worship, something completely different. But this one is still classified as worship because you built idols, but they're in the hidden places. So in John, isn't it interesting in John, when a Samaritan woman comes to um, Jesus, she says, hey, I, you're the one, you're the Christ. And he says, I know we worship in the hills. 
And that was her statement. She said, hey, we worship in the hills, don't we? You know what, you know. And he says, she says that's not the true worshippers. You're going to have to worship in spirit and truth. But Jerusalem was the place of worship. But you see, they didn't want to go down to Jerusalem. They still wanted their, their worship up in the hills. And so you think about that from the Old Testament, right from the time of Deuteronomy. He says, cut them down. And they built them back again. But now they've got it in the hills. And now... Hundreds of years later, the woman is saying to Jesus, hey, the, we worship in the hills. We still do that, even in Jesus' time. And Jesus said to her, believe this, the hours have come. Neither will you worship in the mountain. You're going to have a revelation of who I am. And you're not going to worship in those places no more. People are still worshipping idols. God is a spirit. It goes, and it says he must be worshipping, Jesus said, in spirit and in truth. They had but an imperfection. According to Adam Clark, a corrupted idea of worship. A corrupted mentality of worship. The worship of the Samaritans were defected. They did not understand. They did not have the prophetic word written that was given to the Jews. But acted carnal or on carnal worship. Because they didn't have the letters written in reference of the Spirit of God, according to Adam Clark. So what is he saying? He says, you know, it wasn't instructed to them how to worship, so they just worshipped anyhow. They just said, hey, listen, we're just gonna we're just gonna worship anyhow. And so they lost focus in worship. They didn't understand what worship meant. In other words, we can't just come to God. And worship him anyhow. Isaiah 1 verses 12. So when you come and appear before me. Who has asked this of you. Is trampling of my courts. He said when you come before me. You can't just come and trample in my court. You can't just, you can't just walk and just wilch however you want. When, they, when the, Jesus talked about the temple and the courts of the Gentiles. He says there's a court, there's a place where the Gentiles, he says you can't just walk anywhere. You, this, you can't just walk across the ground. You can't just come before me anyhow you want. Yeah, you know what, Jesus God, you know, I just conf He says, when you step to me, you've got to know who you're coming to. When we talk to God and when we come to worship God, we have to think who we're worshiping. What are we worshipping? What does worship? Is there for, with all of this, is there for the worship of something that will give you back? Is there for something that has a worth in worship? How do we see worship? What are we trying to gain from worship? So what is then worship? So people saw worship and it was many times carnal and it was this, this, this carnal mindset and it's a culture now. You'll go to places and worship is now a frenzy. It's just, it's just, it, it's just everything. It's just, it's, you know, some of you have seen that type of worship and you you wonder what's going on. Some worships are scary. Maybe I've just been in the wrong place then. <laughs> I go someplace and I'm seeing them jumping around. Jeez. You know, you think they're going to knock you out and knock the first 14 rolls out. And you're thinking, why, why, you know, you know, hey, why are you doing that? And so, so it sounds like worship is about us. It sounds like when we're worshipping, it's how we act, the, the carnal thought. How we act, how it makes us, you know, it's about a feeling. How it makes us feel and how it, how it moves. You know, people finish worship, ooh, that really moves me. 
Well, worship wasn't designed that way. This wasn't worship. Worship, number one, was God saying, worship the word worthy, was I'm worthy. The reason you worship me because I'm worthy. And number one, I am God. And you're not. So it was the idea was that he is God, you're not God, and so if you don't worship me, I get nothing. So if you feel, you could say a byproduct, you could say, but if you finish worshiping, ooh, that was good, did something happen or something perhaps went wrong because God feels good about that. You can't take what's God and claim it for yourself right so like he's worthy he's God he's almighty but I get the feelings <laughs> God says no it's all worships for me nothing's for you <laughs> what does worship do well first of all worship kills pride because worship is meant to take your eyes off yourself that's what worship's meant to do. You magnify God because of who he is. So your circumstances and the situation that you face on a day-to-day basis, as you worship God, your eyes are focused on him because he deserves the glory as we sang. And so because he deserves that, we worship him. So your eyes are off yourself. So now God is magnified. And because he's magnified, now he can be glorified because we've magnified and now he can be glorified and so you may feel remnants of a feeling but he says you know I magnified and that now I can be glorified but he's glorified when your eyes are off him it moves you into a place higher than yourself it you know because now it's you, you, it's not self no more, it's selflessness, not selfishness, selflessness. So you've, you now you're bringing God to a place and so it moves you to a place where before you may be down, you know, you come to church and the problems of the world and the, the, the level that you're on by the time you worship, it moves you out of that place higher than yourself. It gives you some perspective because worship can become more therapeutic than anything else you know you, you know sometimes um we was back in jamaica and there's a road i i just love to travel on and it's from Savlamar into saint elizabeth or montego bay and i love the road because the road is windy and um <clears throat> sometimes i you know when i'm traveling i and it's always been in my mind and as I travel down the road, because we're so high, you, 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 and if your eyes allow you to expand, uh, you can see the curvature of the, of the world. You can see that little, the world kind of thinking, man, whew, the world's a big place. <laughs> it's not just flat, it's just because you just, you're so far back. But the sea is, it's, it's, it's uh, when the sun hits that sea, it's like, man. And as you're driving, and, you know, you, as you do when you're driving, when you're down at the sea level, it's kind of, mm, when you're kind of like 4,000 feet high and you're driving down a mountain and you're looking down at the sea uh, and it's kind of, you see the concurvature, the sun's there and then you're thinking about your light bill. How many know that somehow, you know, that kind of awesomeness makes you kind of say, man, it's just, it's so therapeutic. Because you look at the awe and the wonders of God and you're like, man, and you, you see the greatness of that. And so it's like it takes you higher than you are. You know, you start to switch on the radio and start singing songs. <laughs> it's like, yeah. You just, you just, you just, you know what I mean? You just, it, it just makes you want to burst out in a worship song and you just sing, God, you're so good. And I know I've got the bills, I, I know I've got these issues and these issues, but at this present time, you are good. And it gives you some perspective because you just see the awesomeness of God in that one capture. And so worship brings you to a place which is higher than yourself, higher than the situation, it gives you that form of hope. God, you are bigger and you are more than enough.
Worship brings you to a place where you look at the circumstances and you absolutely believe God is able. You just think, man, I don't know, sometimes you just worship God and it's like, you know what, we can do this. <laughs> like you can, like yeah, we, like we God, you know, it's like, it's like the mouse on the top of the elephant and he goes over the bridge and the bridge starts to shake and the mouse says to the elephant, hey, we did good, didn't we? It's like, it's like, it's like somehow, you, you know, when, you, when, you, when, you're, when you're worshiping, you kind of say to God, you know what, I know you are able, God. Because, you know, when you start to worship, you don't just think, oh, God, hey, God, you actually say, God, you're awesome. Mighty is your name. Worthy is your name. Holy is your name. You can shake the earth and the songs start to come out and you realize, God is bigger than the situation. You are the God of the universe. There's a wonderful song, I think is a masterpiece written, um, and uh, the guy wrote, writes it, and he's called So Will I. And he writes it in three stages. And when he sings the song, he sings it in three stages, and he gets to the, you know, um, you've done this, and, he's, and you say, so would I. And I mean, I think the first time I listened to the song, I probably listened to it like 19 times, and I'm listening to the song, and then I, I'm sitting there, and, and then tears come to my eyes. I said, you know what? That's the God I serve. And you look at your circumstance, and you think, you know what? Because you see how big God is, you said, you know what? He can do it. Why? Because you've put God in his rightful place. To live a life of worship means you, live no, you leave no room for sin. You deny everything. Everything has moved out the way because you want God to be worshipped. It's the imagery of a person that says, you know, I want to worship God, but I've got to clear the cluttered spaces. If you remember that song when it says, clear the cluttered spaces for a life Uh, uh, okay, maybe one day we might sing it. <laughs> so it, it, it's just talking about clear the cluttered spaces to move things aside so we can see the true and living God. This is what it does. It gets you to this place where you say, no, God, I just, I just, I just, I just, want, I just want a clean slate. I just, I just want nothing there. You know, sometimes in the morning, when we come, you know, um, we, we, we always put on, sometimes we come and the music, the worship's playing and there's, there's a certain type of, you know, worship we just keep playing, just kind of almost on repeat, but you're just, you're just playing the worship and, and then you're praying and you're, you know, you, you, in your mind, you're, you're listening to the words, how awesome God is. At the same time, you're praying and saying how awesome God is. And you're kind of like, it's kind of like before you clear, before you, you press the button, you kind of want to get certain things. You want to get your chair right. You want to get the scripture right. You want to get the mood right. <laughs> you're kind of like, okay, everything's right. And you just want to clear the place so, so you are able to freely worship for about however long it takes. It just gives you the opportunity. God, I, I want to worship. Times when I, I'm at home and I, you know, I, I want to pray, you know, I, you know, it's like, no, let me drink a cup of tea, let me eat a sandwich, let me do this, let me do that, let me do, let me do everything and just clear the room. So there's no noise, kids are in, shut that door, shut that door. Then you kind of set a place that you can worship. It brings you to a place where you just want to be in the inner chamber with God. You want God to take you away. You want him to do something to you, in you, through you. You want, you want to express everything to God. You say, look, God, I want to lay it out. This is what, what Deuteronomy was concerned with. Deuteronomy was concerned, God was concerned, that they're making things and the things that, the, the things that they were making were from the things that he made. He says, I made that. I, you know, I made the cedar tree. I, I made that. I made the rock. I, I, I put that there. I put that mountain there. You're climbing on my mountain and taking the rocks that I've made and put it there and saying, that's me. <laughs> You're chopping down trees and saying, that's me. 
and you're worshipping things that I've put there. And he's talking about, when he calls his name, he says, but I am the God of creation. These things cannot or neither can they ever create. They can't create. And so his concern was that we substitute worship for things that we can see. We get to a place that we substitute and this is where worship has gone kind of pear-shaped. Because worship's now about us. Who we are. How we feel. What it does to us. And so, again, you could take those words and say, hang on. But I breathe life into you. How can you be worshipping? Why are you getting the benefits from the worship? And so when you start to see that man takes the benefit from the worship, then you see man has not the able or the ability to change because he can't because he's now become God, his own God. And he leaves no room for the God of the universe to change him because the glory goes to him. And that's so much of a danger when it comes to Christian and modern day worship, that worship now is measured. It's just how we, we measure worship. So every worship has a grade. Mm, tonight was a four. I remember last other week it was a five. And we, we, we measure how this, and we start to measure worship. And then we, we start to, you know, all worship has a grade. You know, you wouldn't believe that people travel from churches to churches for worship. I know probably don't believe that. <laughs> so, hey, Pastor, man, the worship's good here. I like, I come here for the worship. You're kind of thinking, what about the preaching? <laughs> well, that's why I preach long to bore them out. You know, so, not joking. But, you know, it's kind of like you actually come for worship. Yeah, because our church doesn't have any. I was saying to the guys, in, uh, when I landed in Jamaica, one of the first things I was talking about was uh, um, Brother Josh worship. You know, Josh just singing from an iPad. And, um, you, know, you know, Josh is a, you know, he's not a powerful singer. He's not, he's not like, you know, Ron Canoli or something, you know. But you know what? As soon as Josh picked up the mic, he goes, we're going to sing this song. And um, but it, it was it was it was like God just walks in a room, you know, and um, you know I'm singing at the back and my hands are up and I'm, I'm looking at him and I'm and he's he, and actually I don't know if I was I don't think I was looking I was just think I'm just in there and I'm thinking to my and I'm looking and I'm and just the spirit of the place just and and you know things I'm wondering about my own stuff and I'm looking at Josh and I'm thinking man and he's pioneering and everything inside of me is saying man. Man, I can do this, man. I'd love to do that. And it's just a hunger for, you know, the thrill of, I was going to say the wind in your hair, but maybe the wind on my head. Uh, <laughs> you know, and I'm looking at Josh, I'm thinking, wow. And But what was more amazing is because I longed to worship like that. Because sometimes I come to church and, you know, you want to stick your hands up and someone's at the door, someone's saying, yeah, so you see, you know, probably my eyes, I see something, I go, <laughs> I lose my concentration. And you, but you want to worship. And so that was probably sort of six, seven months. I, I got to a place where it's like in the service and I'm like, wow. And I'm like, man, Josh, this is incredible. Man, this is, this is fantastic. God's presence, dominion. And you're just thinking all the things, you just, all you see is God. Because God shows up. And we often measure worship. Worship shouldn't be measured. We should never come to church thinking to ourselves, well, I want to go to this place because of the worship and that place because of the worship. See, worship is the people. That's what worship is. The people, when you walk through that door, as you know, as you've probably heard me say, I, 
I went to America. I, I think I've told the story many times, but uh, I went to America. The guy couldn't sing a lick. I mean, he, I mean, the instruments were out of tune, uh, and then he started to sing, and I'm like, no way. And people kept coming in, and like, I mean, he's just so off key. I mean, he's just like, I was with my son and Ryan looked at, looked at Ryan and Ryan's in tears. I'm like, I can't look at my son because he's laughing. And, I, and, I, and, and, then, and then he walks out the room and he's like, I thought, so I thought he had the palpitation. He walks out the room and, I, and I'm like, and I thought, you know, let me find him. As I walk in the corridor, yo, what's the matter, Ryan? He goes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was like. And so I'm like, oh, Ryan, you can't be like that. But <laughs> so I walk back in there, and I'm just like, I'm just, I'm just like, so, so I'm standing in the room, and everything says, Jimmy, go and speak to the pastor. You're an experienced pastor. Talk to him. Say, hey, buddy, you know what? Um, I know you. I, hey, I know you got, but you know, th there's limits here. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I said honestly I'm just being honest I, in my head I'm like come on man you'll see the pastor come on just tell him brother there's limits here you know you, know, you can't run the people like this. but people's in the place their hands and I'm like you know what this can't go on in the name of Jesus this can't go on so I so I plucked up the courage and I went to turn and he walks past me because he it was the last song and he gets up and he was six or seven times worse and I was like that's why you got him to sing. But he's terrible. And, and you're just... <laughs> then God... God got me, man. And God convicted me right there. And I'm looking at everybody's hands worshipping. I'm the only one laughing. So I, I opened my bag. I was going out through my notes. <laughs> I opened my bag to laugh in my bag. <laughs> and I'm laughing at it. And God said, like, how dare you? It's not about him, it's about me. And I was like, woo. And my face straightened out straight away, hands went up. I just sang straight out of key. Praise hey, Lord! <laughs> I thought, you know what, who cares? Who cares? We're all out of key. But the Spirit of God was there. And I kept on wondering, why does every. But you see, when God shows up, God hadn't called all of us to be Pavarotti. Some can, some can't sing. It really doesn't matter. All God's listening. The Bible says the eyes of the Lord go to and fro across the face of the earth, seeing who is worshipping him. And when we don't worship him, he gets nothing. He sits in heaven and goes, man, he's rolling on the floor. He's involved in himself. He thinks it's all about him. He thinks he's Michael Jackson. <laughs> It goes as well. Uh, nothing today. Let me look somewhere else. Imagine that. That would be deep. I mean, that's profound. God comes and let's start our song service and God looks at our church and goes, yeah, it's all about them. Uh, let's go down to the Philippines, see what's happening. Because it's not about us. When people come, even Corinthians talking about those speaking in tongues. But he's talking about the church. And he's talking about the church in the sense of the framework of the church. That the church was there, they were speaking in tongues and they were, you know, prophesying and, and all that. But, you know, he makes a statement and he says, you know, when, when, when God's spirits are there, people prophesy. And he says, don't people come in and say, this is God. So Paul was saying... People will actually walk in and say, hang on, this is God. And so Paul's making a statement that within the worship, within the time, within the church together, people actually recognize there's a God in the house. Now, I think that's very profound. Because when you start to think about how profound that is, he's saying, although the church is a mess, although the church is arguing and this and that, he says, when they are worshiping, they actually know who they're worshiping. And he says, the guy's prophesying and this person is saying something. He says, but he says, if they, if they just have a bit of order, that's all he was saying, order 
in who says this and how he says it. And he said, if you get a bit of order in the church, those who walk in that don't know God will say, this is God. And I found that quite profound because Paul is saying that people can actually walk in the church and see that it is God. People can watch people worshipping and see their worshipping is God. People can actually recognise that the people are worshipping a God. They're fixed on a God. Their lives and their, their mindset is fixed on worship. And something about watching people, just like I did, when you watch people, eyes are fixed on God. And when you watch people worshiping, and it's all about God, there's something that does something to you. Because it's like you want to put your hands in front of them, but they're just so fixed on God. You're thinking, man, they're worshiping something far greater than themselves. See, worship is an attitude. It's a mindset. Is a man and a woman that comes and says, God, I want to come and worship you. From the very beginning, if a man says, God, I, I just come to worship you, you already know there's a denial. He's saying, hey, you know, I'm denying myself. It's not about me. And he forces himself away because he understands God must be worshipped. Because he deserves the highest praise. Worship is something that we teach. And it's never going to be about our instruments, our skill. Um, although I understand when David says they played skillfully before the Lord and there, there must be a level of people, skill comes in. It's like anything. If I'm going to play, I want to play the best before God. I'm going to sing the best before God. I'm gonna, there, there's, there's obviously that element of that. But... The main thing is that there's, we, 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 we're so desperate for God to come in, we want to invite his presence in. More than anything, our worship should be welcoming to God. Although people get benefit from it, but the people we want, um, I'm going to close, I think I said this before, one of the pastors they were going to do a service in the, in, in the hall. It was big, and the hall was too big. And so he just said, um, can I um, take it into a small room? Um, I said, why? He says, because it feels cozy. It feels comfortable. It feels, it feels really good. It, the big room is but too big, and you know, there's, there's not enough people. The room is 600 people, and we've only got 100, and we, we just go and move it to the room of 100. And then I remember me saying to him, well, why would you do that? And he says, well, because you want to get the feeling right. And then I said to him, but the earth is the Lord and the fullness of it. He said, what do you mean? I said, the earth is the Lord. He said, but he said, well, it's more. I said, but the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. Therefore, that means you should be able to take the hundred people into Wembley Stadium and the presence of God fills the stadium. He owns everything. His presence can fill the whole world. He can fill any stadium. He doesn't need, you know, he's not restricted by, you know, a room. And that's when he said, I went into the room. We went there and he says, the presence of God came down. I said, but that's what it does. You see, the truth is, if you want God in there, he'll turn up. If you want to feel good about yourself, you'll just feel good about yourself. You won't feel energized. You won't feel the spirit of God. You'll just feel good about yourself. And But the worst part about it is that if you get to that point, you won't see God in the way you should see him as a God that's magnified to be glorified. You'll just see him as God of the hills and God in the valley. Let's build an attitude of worship. Because we worship him in spirit and truth. Could you say amen? amen? Let's have every head bow, every eye closed. God bless you. As our heads are bowed and eyes are closed for one moment in time, we just want to bring the service to a close. As our heads are bowed, eyes are closed very quickly. Maybe you're, as you're here this evening, heads are bowed and eyes closed. 
you're not saved, you're not born again, you say pray for me quickly. We'll quickly pray for you this evening. Uh, you want prayer? Can we pray for you? Uh, don't know Jesus very quickly. Quickly slip it up and slip it down again. Front to back, left to right. We're going to change the order of this service. Amen. We kind of want to open this. Worship is an attitude. We give ourselves to it. We want the Spirit of God to be there. We want to sing like we've never sang before. We want to play like we've never played before. So we're going to come and we're going to pray. Maybe you want to pray in your seat or come. But we do want to pray and say, God, not when somebody comes, we invite somebody to our church and we say, what do you think about our worship? Hey, what do you, what do you think about our worship in our church? What we should be saying is, God, what do you think about my worship? How's my worship? Did I do enough? Did I sing enough? How was my worship, God? I think that's the real question when we come to worship God. Is God, how is my worship? Do I worship you? Or am I consumed with the hills and the valleys? So I want to open this altar. Maybe we can foster a new thought pattern about worship. You know, when I come to church, I'm going to get ready to worship. That's what I really want to do. So I want to open, maybe you can pray in the seat, you want to come and pray. But we want to pray, amen, and, and ask God to help us with our worship. Because I, I think this is the house of worship. And we should be worshiping. For no other reason but because he's God. So this altar's open this evening. You want to come, you can come and pray. Amen. Let's believe our God this evening. Amen. As we come and we pray. Father, by your grace.